You're up, Rene. Okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome back to your early 60 minutes. We changed the, the, the time. Now it's going to be 5 p.m., as you see. Uh, basically, the idea is that during this COVID period, uh, that we're now more busy around this coast, that many people can uh, join us. And basically, our faculty, or friends, they don't need any further introduction. Everybody knows these professors. Um, I don't want to take more time and start enjoying their knowledge and expertise um, talking about complications. Basically, I'm, be, I'm going to be showing uh, some robotic and laparoscopic complications, upper track and lower track, and then uh, we will have our panel uh, making comments how to prevent and how to treat uh, the complications. I'm going to share my, my screen. Here are the um, staff, faculty first. I want to be um, very clear that these materials provided by Eurolis around the world uh, who have kindly agreed to share their experience so others can learn from and can avoid these complications. And we take it very seriously. When we use this material, we know the whole case is not to make fun, it's to really learn and to share the experience. Um, it's very important when we start always a case to discuss with the team and to promote awareness of all the aspects of the procedure in which complications um, are more likely to occur. Always think outside the abdomen, uh, always ask uh, for any, uh, any opinion of the uh, sometimes the fellows or people around the robot. They have a different perspective or you've seen. Sometimes you're completely focused and you don't see things around. You have like a microscope view. And that's why it's always important to see outside, ask for questions, be very interactive. Always remember that fast surgery versus slow. Be careful that if you want to, if you're in a hurry, if you're if you're too anxious to finish, you may have a complication and make it slower. And you need to know how to prevent any complication. And sometimes you need to treat them, even if you're not a general surgeon, because sometimes general surgeons are not that used to see this kind of complication in your early area. And then we need to know exactly what they need to do when these complications occur. We're gonna see basically six topics. We're gonna to talk about epigastric and iliac veins and uh, uh, renal artery bleeding. Then we're gonna see some obturator nerves, some ureteric injuries, urine leak, rectal injury, and some post-operative bleeding and how to treat it. The first one, uh, basically, they're gonna start getting access to the uh, um, retrograde to prevesicle space. And you're gonna see that they're preparing for a, there's the vas deferent and they're following the vas deferent. And now they make an injury to the epigastric artery. And they try to put some clips and uh, they try to put some suture and it continue bleeding. They try, they, they put a bulldog, they thought that was iliac artery and they put the bulldog in the vast different. And of course, still bleeding. Mihir, what would be your approach at this moment? So um, whenever there is a, a injury in the vicinity of a external iliac slash epigastric, you have to be prepared for, you know, it could be either the iliac, it could be the epigastric itself. The one thing I would comment is that you should not be in a rush to put in clips or stitches. They probably wasted a lot of time getting a suture ready because there was no vascular control. The moment you made that incision, step number one should be to immediately at least get a, a control of that bleeder and then define the anatomy. Is it from the epigastric? Is it from the iliac itself? Because remember, the more time you waste, there's gonna be a hematoma that develops in that location, which actually makes these, then finding the specific vessel progressively more difficult. So you wanna one, get good control, define the anatomy, and don't be in a mm -hmm. rush to putting clips and sutures before defining what you're clipping or suturing. Yeah, they end basically opening the face. They couldn't to control the big hematoma to don't let them identify the anatomy. This is another case. Uh, 
they're doing the leave no dissection and you see with the uh, scissor, there was basically also the metal part was touching the iliac vein. Um, Jeff, how do you avoid that kind of complications? So, I, the, can, can you show that again? I'm, I'm going to show it back. Please show it again. Yeah, I see that. So the shield, I'm sorry, the, yeah, the, uh, how to avoid the complication. One has to be obviously aware of the wrist. And even though the scissors have a, uh, the shield on it, uh, clearly uh, there can be cracks in it. You're relying on the person who's actually uh, the technician to put it together for you. And so I think it's critical that you just need to keep your uh, wrists away and use the articulation of the robot to your advantage and, and turn your wrist so you can actually reach around the vein without actually hitting it. And, and it can happen also with uh, not only scissors, it can happen with anything that had help. It can happen with uh, ultrasonic scissors. We have seen that laparoscopy also. And very important that you increase the neumo and usually this bleeding stop and you can take care because it's a venous bleeding. But you have to be careful if you have all these intermittent compression devices in the legs because they will pump blood up. And I have seen two videos where they put some tourniquets around the iliac vein because it did not stop the bleeding, even increasing the neumo. And it's because they have these intermittent compression devices. Mike, this is a case for you. Okay. This is a, a patient that, um, it was a laparoscopic case uh, many, many years ago. Um, um, they shared this video that um, they was doing this big tumor, laparoscopy um, nephrectomy. And... Uh, it's a long time ago. Yeah. <laughs> you see the, uh, but it's interesting how some key they found one artery. Uh, and now they keep, and they suppose that in, there's the aorta, what they think, and they, they think that the, renal, the main artery is there. That's what they have on their mind, no? Can you go back one more time a little bit? I just want to see the relationship of the artery and the vein. Yeah, I'm going to go back. Okay. Sorry. Vein. They found the vein there. Okay. Yeah. That's the vein. Now they found this. Uh, they are small artery. And they feel that the artery is going to be higher, no? Because they found the vein. Oh, I saw a little bit right there. Got it. Okay. Okay. And now they decide to, to progress. Okay. This was a, another big artery. Yeah. Okay, what you will do here? So I would have done almost exactly what they did, which is put a hand in. Okay. Um, and actually, I've had the same exact situation happen to me when I was uh, with a staper misfile about a month, about a year ago. I think I even sent you that video. Yeah. So a couple of things I'm a little worried about is what artery they clipped, first of all, because that is a little bit away from the uh, medial on the aorta. So that's something I'm keeping in the back of my mind is I fix this problem and I'm going to try to at least, you know, get a clip on this and address that immediately. But this has to be addressed. So the first thing you need to do is you need to get the entire team in the room aware of what the heck is going on right now. You need to tell anesthesia to start a, uh, you know, large perfusion protocol. You need another IV. You need vascular surgery. You need as, you know, a, an open tray in the room. You need everything together. While you're doing that, you need to try to get pressure on this. And 
this is a hard one to get pressure on with just even like a fourth arm, you know, if you were using or, or certainly laparoscopically very hard. And it, you try to keep his pressure as much as you can. And, and if he couldn't, they did a great job. They got their hand in uh, the abdomen quickly and they're able to put pressure on it. And okay. That, and, yeah. And how you will get your hand in? You will put one hand, two hands, what do you would do? So I wouldn't open because I think once you open, you really are, you know, you're, you're, you're sort of tying both hands behind your back in a way initially. So I would actually, you know, you have your camera in there, you're sucking, um, you have, you get someone else in the room to help you basically just open up, grab a, I would just grab a, 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 you know, a hand port, just, I wouldn't worry about, you know, the incision and cosmesis. I would just open, you know, take one of your ports that are there, open up right on that lower quadrant port and stick your hand in and get pressure and pack it. If but you don't have a, if you don't have a hand port, what do you do? Just make a small incision, you know, as far as of three inches and stick your hand in and then wrap some towels around it. But you've got to get pressure on this. Otherwise, trying to open and then do it, I think, will be more difficult. And, and sometimes getting a hand port will be uh, maybe yeah. more difficult in this. Um... You don't need a hand port um, to do this. Okay, now they, they get the hand directly without hand port. Uh, they're compressing and they're trying to get a better exposed to know exactly what happened, no? Yeah. They, they try from different angles. They go. So at this point, there's three things that are going on in my brain. Number one is, am I gonna be able to do this? Um, yeah. Number three is, what did I injure beforehand? And number four is how much is in the bucket? And at some point, if you can't get control of this, and I would give myself 500 cc's in the bucket and um, probably 10 to 15 minutes to do this, I would stop and just open okay. with, the, with the hand in place. And, and very important you saw that, you need to compress and, and really try to suction, in, increase your expose before getting, yeah because if you know it's gonna still bleed and then you will not have the option to try to control. Uh, you was mentioning very important also that the first thing you ask that you wanna see again the films, you wanna see again the CT scan, you wanna see the anatomy, it's very important uh, that you know exactly how many arteries you're gonna expect. It's not used to go cutting and you just find vessels as you progress. You yeah. need to know exactly how many arteries and how many veins you expect uh, to find. Uh, this is a, a patient that was many, many years ago. Before you do that, I just want to mention one last thing. To avoid this, okay, you need much more traction on the kidney. You need better exposure to the aorta. I, I, and I think many of us, when they have a hilum like that, that's very edematous or inflamed or has a lot of hyalur, will actually go to the aorta uh, toward the lower, you know, toward the iliacs and work our way up along the aorta to find the arteries. Um, so I think exposure, don't be afraid about getting close to the aorta and sort of working your way up known to unknown and a lot of stretch would help prevent that. Yeah, sometimes it's safer be exactly in the aorta wall that known where you are. This was a case that was trying to do um, a single port right adrenalectomy and, uh, and you're gonna see that with the uh, they're doing now dissecting, they're bringing the duodenum down and there's the cava vein, there's the renal vein, the liver is perfectly retracted and with the two millimeter instrument, uh, there was an injury basically to the renal vein, very, very close to the cava vein. And, and you see they add ports, they, uh, they compress, they get gusses and laps and everything in. Mihir, what you will do now? So this is likely, you know, working on the vena cava and the right renal vein area. So it's likely a venous injury. So that's number one. And so uh, compression almost always gets control of venous injuries. And again, the one thing not to do is to try to be too quick to clip or staple or suture. So that's one thing you don't do. 
So this was a single port case. So clearly put in two, three additional 12 millimeter ports so that you have good exposure and access, get the sponge in and give pressure. And the other thing that works well with uh, venous injuries, and if it's a small little hole made by the two millimeter grasper, then once you've identified, you've gotten the pressure up, maybe a little bit increase in the pneumo um, um, pressure also to help you. And once you slow it down enough, you should be able to find that hole in the vein, wherever it is. And usually a, a rescue stitch works very well uh, for these kind of venous injuries. How you prepare the rescue suture? What's the concept of the rescue suture? So rescue suture, is a con the concept is you need a stitch where with one hand you can throw a stitch pull and get tamponade so that you don't have to use both hands because likely your other hand is suctioning or, or doing something else. So that's number one. Number two, the suture should not be too long. If it is too long, you're just going to be pulling forever. Second, thirdly, the needle should be big, a CT1 or a CTX because you have to find that needle in blood. So if it's an RB1 or some flimsy needle, you'll never find it. And, uh, and thirdly, at the end, you can have a, a laparotide or a hemolock clip that gives you that a tamponade. And you also want to use something like a vicryl that gives you good malleability also. Uh, uh, then eventually to repair it, you can use whatever the hell you want. But to get this initial control, uh, a, a short, I would say about a four, cent, four inch a stitch, CT1 needle, two or vicryl with a weck at the end is what I would use. Jeff, do we do, a, do, we do any difference? I would. <clears throat> You agree. I think you want you don't want to be tying a knot here necessarily, especially in a laparoscopic scenario. Maybe robotically you may feel a enough at doing it. But I, I agree. Um, I do find that for venous bleeding, you can really push the pressure up. Um, in some patients, I don't know if this was done, but you can really drive the pressure up to 20 millimeters of mercury quite comfortably and honestly for a short period of time you can even drive it up higher um, and I think you can feel comfortable with that. The key with driving the pressure up is you have to remember to drive the pressure back down. No one else in the room is going to remember to drive it down except for you. Um, of course, the, 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 the situations where we forgot to drive it down and uh, the anesthesiologist will remind you in a little bit. And very important. How you will do the follow-up of this patient after this repair? Any, any possible anticoagulation, any possible complication that you expect that can happen after this repair of the vein? I have not. I don't think, you know, it depends on how much you compromise the vein here. This is a small enough hole that you really should not be compromising the lumen significantly. And uh, no, I mean, for, for, any, for venous injuries, I would not consider anticoagulation. Mike, um, any comment? I would do it very similar. I think the choice of rescue suture is a little different. I do like a, uh, a smaller needle, um, but he's, I think that's a good point. I'll take back from it here that a bigger needle is easier to find. Um, I actually use proline. Um, I'll probably use Vicol now after listening to me here. I think all those points are really good. It doesn't matter. Um, I, in terms of checking the blood flow, I, I agree with Jeff 100%. Doesn't look like it's, you know, looking at that, looks completely filled, the vein. Easily, you can bring an ultrasound probe in, though. You can look at resistive indices. You can check flow. You can check Doppler. You can bring a VTI Doppler probe in. I mean, there's a lot of ways you could check to make sure there's not a problem. Probably even ICG would work um, if you were doing robotically. But um, I think every, I agree with everything. I will say I did have a case I can share with you next time where I was, it was a solitary kidney with a, I was doing a partial and I pulled out a thrombus out of one of the, veins in the kidney, a branch. And as soon as I pulled the thrombus out and I was only working on a pneumo of 15, he got an air embolism and he dropped his CO2 into like the 10 range. So you can see that happen. Um, again, I think there's a very different scenario. This guy ha already had the vein sort of blocked and dilated. This, uh, there was still bleeding coming out. But um, again, I, I've only seen it once in my life. So I agree with Jeff. You could probably crank this sucker up a lot. But just think in your head, you know, if all of a sudden they, they lose their CO2 up at the top, you should uh, back that down quickly. Okay. Uh, very important, as, as all of you mentioned, compress, increase NELMO, tamponade, 
immediately change uh, the instruments. They need to be switched. You see some surgeons that get paralyzed with the scissors and they don't immediately, they need to be changed, rescue suture. Very careful suction if it's a venous bleeding and uh, quick decisions, increase uh, ports, one hand in, and if you cannot do it, get two hands in. This is the MRH tray. Uh, the only different thing here is that some people are using now more Gore-Tex suture uh, because also it's like a more easy to, to do, to maneuver with the suture than the monofilaments sutures. And uh, also the needle is not that big uh, as the CT ones that sometimes can make more big holes in the cava vein. Now we're gonna see some nerves uh, injuries. Uh, very important that we always need to see the nerve and always, is, you need to be careful that sometimes when you pull the uh, lymph node package, you move also the nerve and you can injure the nerve thinking that uh, it's in, in another location. Uh, this one, it's uh, during a cystectomy. They got uh, the stapler and now they found that they had uh, transect uh, the nerve with the stapler. I mean, here, what do you would do there now? So first, how to avoid it, and second, what you how you treat that injury. So uh, the the way to avoid an obturator nerve injury during cystectomy, specifically, since that's the question in mind, uh, is uh, you want to stay on your pedic medial to the obliterated umbilical uh, artery. So when I when I do my cystectomy, I actually identify the obliterated umbilical, I make my window on the inside of it, so medial to it, so that all the obturator structures are lateral to the obliterated umbilical artery. I will clip it at the end, but that's when the cystectomy is all done. You, come, you drop the bladder, you take the obliterated umbilical and the vas, and then you head towards the prostate apex. Uh, if you stay outside the obliterated umbilical and take that along with your superior vesicle packet, your stapler can go into the, into the nerve, and that, that becomes a challenge. Um, uh, and it's always good in, in locally advanced cases, et cetera, to identify where that nerve force is um, before you, you take any uh, major leak pedicles. Uh, once it's happened like this with a stapler, my, I, my guess is they would have lost um, a reasonable amount of length. So I don't think primary approximation is going to work. Uh, if you just divide it, uh, you can re-approximate the perineural sheath. But here you may have to use some form of a, a graft. As you see, they try a few times until they decide uh, to use the graft. What's exactly the uh, clinical um, symptoms of this patient after these kind of injuries? So clinically, there will be uh, difficulty in abducting the, the uh, you know, these are adductor muscle weaknesses. So you just, patients will say, I can't move my leg out of the bed. That's usually the first thing they will complain the morning after surgery. They have to physically, if you see them, they will actually hold the thigh and move it out to get out of bed. So uh, uh, that lateral movement of the lower extremity, and, and you can actually see this even without obvious injury. So in some extended node dissections of prostate, some people will complain of temporary weakness, and that usually gets better with time. It takes a few weeks, and till that happens, they need to be warned not to drive, otherwise uh, you, know, you can have an accident. I had one patient who actually didn't have a formal injury, but he did have some weakness, and he did not even realize that he has weakness in the hospital, and at home, in the driveway, he just could not get his foot off the, the, you know, the, uh, the, the gas to the brake. And, and, but he was at very low speed and just, you know, so you have to warn them. So I think uh, anytime you do a node dissection, you can still get stretch neuropraxia from the nerves. It doesn't have to be a formal transaction, but, but these are uh, the symptoms. And if it is only neuropraxia, in about four to six weeks with some physical therapy, they usually recover. Again, you see here, they... Uh... You see how the I'm gonna I'm gonna go see the leg how it moves. Uh, you see how the leg contract when they uh, clip the nerve. They went back. They they check. They thought that the nerve was medially and they transect. And now they had a complete transection of the nerve. So that's the, always the place where it's going to happen, right? It's not going to happen up uh, all the way, you know, by the pubic bone. It's always going to happen 
where the nerve comes underneath the iliac. So another way, if you're having a trouble identifying that, what you can do is you can take, like you do in a cystectomy, you can go lateral to the iliac artery and vein, push the artery and vein off of the sidewall and identify the nerve that way and free the packet up that way. So if you're in this point, like, you know, there's a lot of fat there, you know, is obviously a heavy guy. Um, you can, if you're struggling to find the nerve or you want to be 100%, just go lateral to the vessels and you get into that triangle of Marseille there. Um, but this is the classic place for it to happen, right? As it enters or comes underneath the vein. We're going to see another example, uh, very, you see, they, they see the nerve, but another important point, Mike, I have some videos, it's rare to have it distally, but I have some, some videos where they transect it also in the pubic bone. <laughs> you need to keep always see the nerve, but usually happen in this angle where the iliac vein is bifurcating. And you see, And, and you see here the nerve. Yeah. Okay, it's coming here. It looks like it's has moved a little bit out with the uh, fat, but the nerve looks like it's coming here. You see the nerve here? Yeah. But they thought that the nerve was, and now they're transecting the nerve. I think this is an example where you should dissect from the known to the unknown. Unknown, yeah. And not start in an unknown spot. They had the they had the nerve more crystal clearly identified. Yeah, they did not recognize it, and they and there's not, the not any, and there's That's no the any other spot. structure that that. Oh, I think it's the obturator artery. Yeah. Ooh. Wow. <laughs> now this is, by this time they should have known. <laughs> yeah. Okay, again, before you put any clip, uh, you need to come exactly following what you see and, and then uh, that you see the nerve, you can get it. Now let's see some ureteric injuries. Uh, it's very important that uh, you can make injuries in the ureter in different points. Uh, we can, we're gonna see some examples and all, all these locations. Very important that many of these ureteral injuries are diagnosed postoperatively. And uh, you have to be aware that first, not all the urine leaks in the drain are coming from the anastomosis. And you need to rewind the movie and you need to know exactly if you did leave no dissection, if you did French approach, because you need to know all the locations where you can do injuries to the ureter. Uh, we're going to see some of these examples. Always uh, very important if you can have indiocarmine or uh, fluorescein to try to identify the ureters in case you have any injury. First example is when you're doing the, the poster of bladder neck and uh, you're trying, you always need to see the UOs. And I'm going to show you uh, some example they was doing here. And they see urine coming out. And they found now that they, the ureter is completely outside of the bladder. Monish, let me, let me hear what you would do here. I 
Janae? Yeah. Since Mihir is not there, I'll take it. Yeah, yeah, of course. <laughs> so I think what they're doing, and you're seeing as you're running the video, is you, you're, they, are, they are mobilizing some of the ureter, and I think that's the intramural part. Um, and essentially, you're going to have two choices. One is you're going to do an extensive mobilization of the ureter and re-implant it uh, farther up in the bladder. Um, I mean, basically, you need to know your choices. You need to know your options. When you transect the ureter or the UO close to the trigone, you can try to marsupialize it back into the bladder. Um, and uh, I've done that where you can uh, literally spatulate the intramural ureter uh, in the bladder. But if you're completely outside the bladder like here, I think a, a re-implantation um, and I wouldn't do it at the trigone. I would re-implant it in a, a little bit farther up on the bladder sidewall. I think um, what they did here is this. They did a marsupialization in the trigone. But of course, you need to know exactly the, uh, the options, no? Yeah, I, I mean, that's a, that's a fine operation. You know, we do know that when we re-implant the ureter on the sidewall of the bladder, the success rate of that procedure is literally close to 99%. And when you're re-implanting it in the trigone and you're reconstructing the trigone, the bladder neck at the same time as doing an anastomosis, I think that makes a much more complex repair. Not that it's, it's, it's okay to do, but just not forget that a, a simple ureteral reimplantation has an incredibly high success rate. We don't need a second complication. Now they're doing a salvage prostatectomy and they go, everything is difficult and, and doing the poster dissection, they again see some urine leak. And they're not irrigating and they're obviously seeing some urine leak. They found that they have transect also the ureter but outside the bladder. And uh, it looks like it was not a complete transection and they did, uh, they got the stent and they repair the ureter. But you always need to be paying attention always, not only when you see the UO in the bladder, it's also when you're doing the muscle, the detrus or dissection, that you can also injure the ureter there. This was another example, a case that I have in Venezuela many years ago. They called me to the OR and because there was something in the detrusor that looks like a ureter. And I got two, two wires up and it, it was a completely a double system completely going out. And sometimes you don't think about that and it is very rare, but it can happen. And the other situation, it's when you're doing the French approach. And uh, when you go in the Douglas pouch, uh, that some people can get Confuse and they can get the ureter instead of the vas deferens. And this is the example. That's the ureter. Here, how you avoid that complication? Um, so, if you're going the posterior approach, you number one want to make sure that you are not deviating too laterally. I think the the, the ureter you will get if you veer too far away. So you have to be you know, seeing the vas, the SVs, and stay very close to the SV wall. The moment you start going laterally, then you can start getting uh, into something. And if you see a tubular structure and it doesn't follow the pathway of the vas deferens, uh, be very, very careful at that uh, posterior approach. So here, I think you're, he's way lateral to the, to the SV. Okay, they did not recognize the injury. They proceed and the patient was leaking urine from the drain and they thought that it was from the anastomosis and they took the patient back and they put more sutures in the anastomosis and the patient still leaking urine. Uh, how you would do if you suspect that you did it? If, how would you try to recognize uh, during the surgery and what you would do in this case if you recognize that you transect the ureter there? So if it is at this level, you obviously when you open the bladder, uh, you, you, when you open the bladder neck, you can uh, put a, a ureteral catheter or a wire through the ureteral orifice and you'll see the, the wire come out. Um, uh, that, that's one way to uh, find it out. If it happens during the lymph node dissection, obviously you can trace the ureter proximally distally and, and know that it is the, the ureter. In this location, it's a little more challenging. So you have to rely on threading a, a, a retrograde uh, catheter from the, from the ureteral orifice. Okay. You can also give something IV. You can give something intravenously if you have that capability of 
you know, indigo carmine, et cetera, but, but that will take a little while. I, I just feel that, uh, you know, putting a wire through the UO is much more direct. The other location is when you're doing leaf node dissection. And then uh, here's an example. So, you know, the first thing I notice here is they're working in a hole, right? And so what me here said earlier, it goes absolutely along with this. You want to open up, especially if you're doing a pelvic lymph node dissection, you want to open that peritoneum all the way up to the anterior abdominal wall. You want to identify the medium umbilical ligament. And as long when you're doing a lymph node dissection, you're on the lateral side of the medial umbilical ligament, you will never hit the ureter. Oh, yeah. So, you know, here we are, they want to do a full lymph node dissection. And they're working in a hole which is the size of about two centimeters. And and they go and they found here something that they thought it was the ureter and was the hypogastric artery here. As you see, they're gonna. That's exactly that's the ureter. You Mike Mike said is absolutely right. I I think. An axiom in open surgery has always been no exposure is too wide. And, and the same thing in laparoscopic robotic, within the patient, no exposure is too wide. You need to identify all your anatomy before you cut anything. And if you need exposure, get more exposure inside. Michael is exactly right. Never work in a hole. But so that's the way to avoid it. <laughs> but yeah. obviously they didn't because they just went through it, it looks like. And, and very important, they did not recognize it. No. And they proceed with the surgery and the patient was leaking. And when the patient, when the patient is leaking and uh, they come with this and they have, they're distended, they're having pain and they're, they have the uh, JP that looks like urine. Now, me here, what you will do now? How you will know that's, that's urine or not? And what would be your approach to that? So obviously they didn't uh, recognize it intraoperatively. So if, if, if you, you send this fluid for creatinine, uh, it's gonna be high. So you know it's a urine leak. Uh, if you were confident nowadays with robotic prostatectomy, I mean, if I get a massive urine leak day one, in an anastomosis that had gone absolutely like a robotic prostate, we should go. I know that I need to be looking for something more. It's actually a little easier now with robotics because it's very, very rare that you get a, a completely leaking anastomosis. But clearly, you can quickly do a cystogram, make sure that the anastomosis is uh, okay. If you do an ultrasound or a CT, most of the times with a ureteral injury, you're going to find some hydro or some upper tract finding on that side. But a negative cystogram, and a positive urine leak almost confirms that you injured the, the ureter. Okay, you do this histogram, you know that you have, first you do this, the, uh, the creatinine, and you know that's urine, you do this histogram, and you know that's leaking, and uh, sometimes you have the catheter, uh, the JP drain, too close to the anastomosis, and people say because it's suction, because the catheter is too close, obviously the anastomosis was not perfect, and the patient is, is leaking. Uh, one option they have described using uh, this catheter with the side fenestrated catheters that can help to reduce uh, the leak because they have these lateral holes. But basically, we have worked and, and summarized this algorithm that if you have urine leak, you do the creatinine, then you do the cystogram or the CT scan. And this first question you need to do is that is the patient has symptoms or the patient is, doesn't have any symptoms? Yeah, the patient is clinically uh, having, is distended, is having ileus, is having pain. There's a different scenario that the patient is completely uh, asymptomatic. The patient is leaking, but the patient is not distended and is not having pain. If the patient is not having symptoms, uh, you can slowly, first you can remove the suction, but you cannot do it immediately because if you remove the suction, that urine is gonna collect, get, get collected. And then 
after you get the, the, the tract and the fistula directed with the drain, then you, re, you remove the suction and then you start mobilizing the drain. But if the patient has symptoms, Mihir, the patient is distended, the patient has ileus, what do you do? So if the patient is uh, significantly symptomatic, uh, if the drain is still in there, uh, one, one option is to, uh, to divert them. Uh, you can either divert them by putting in uh, bilateral single J ureteral stents or working them. My personal thing is uh, um, most of the times uh, you are able to get a retrograde single J stent in and they actually provide slightly better drainage to keeping things dry than a nephrostomy medium and obviously less invasive. So uh, those are the two options to, to, to treat them. Uh, sometimes uh, if the drain is just not adequate and there is patient is really getting signs of urinary peritonitis and if you have to go in to just clean that out, you may want to then at that time do a cystogram and if you're already in there uh, laparoscopically, uh, you could see if you can you know fix uh, that leak or at least reduce it in caliber that the healing is going to be optimized. We already have Dr. Gill also on, on, on the panel. Uh, Indy, if you have any comment, welcome. And um, As Jeff. Jeff. Welcome, Michael and uh, uh, Dr. Stifelman and Dr. Jeff Kadedu. Thank you, guys. Really appreciate it. It's so great to see you. And uh, um, you're just an amazing friends and colleagues. And, um, so thank you. Uh, also, Renee, great job. And Mihir, great job. I've been listening. So. I guess, uh, Renee, my, my only comment would be um, um, waiting for the guy to get symptomatic is waiting too long. If there is a urine leak beyond what one would expect, um, you know, appropriate uh, scanning, uh, cystogram or, and or CT must be done and intervention based on uh, the site of drainage, a uh, site of leak and uh, not to wait for being symptomatic. I mean, Either we move, if it's an astomotic thing, different story. But if it's anything other, you um, need to jump on it. Yeah, this is only an astomotic leak. Oh, this is okay. only an astomotic leak. And we already have done the CT scan and the cystogram. And we know that the leak, and we know the degree of the leak. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be a little contrarian here. Okay. I'm going to say, most of the time, if you have this sort of leak, you probably have a hematoma that's formed. You've got some sort of distraction. So I would F, I would absolutely start with a CT cystogram with yeah. uh, with IV because I want to make sure my upper tracts are fine. I want to see what's going on to cause this leak. If I've got a large hematoma that's formed to cause the distraction in injury, I would go back. I would not wait and let it heal and put drains and give this guy six weeks of torture. I would say, you know something? You're 24 hours out. I'm going back. I'm going to redo the entire anastomosis. Get rid of the hematoma, put it back together again. Okay, and got some it, good data on that. Um, so, Michael, got, question for you is: uh, How many times have you had to do that? Me? Zero. zero. Right. So, zero. I, I think all of us, yeah. the number would be zero. Uh, so, uh, draining a hematoma that is resulting in uh, dropping crit and hemodynamic instability, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, is one is a different story, um, but if it's a urine leak, um, you know, re-anastomosis, we just, you know, have not had occasion to do this. No, but we, we have seen some videos where they have a, a huge hematoma and complete disruption of the anastomosis or a severe disruption. There's a different scenario. But suppose that you do the yeah. cystogram, the CT scan, it's a, it's a leak that not it's a big hole, but it's draining a lot. But the, the drain is doing its job and the patient is not being distended and the patient doesn't have pain. You can wait and you can try to mobilize the drain. But if the patient is distended and it's having ileus, sometimes putting, uh, you need to go and put some uh, mono J stents in order to get all the urine out. And, and, and when you move the drain, uh, this happened to us one case that sometimes the people say, okay, you move the drain out and, uh, and, and you can put a bag and, and then you can wait. Uh, they move the drain out and what happened that they put the bag and when the patient came back one week after to remove the bag, there was no drain. 
the drain uh, moved completely in the abdomen and we need to we went laparoscopically to remove the, the rest of the drain that was left in the learning point here is that we always now use these kind of clips if you're going to cut the drain and put it in a bag be safe, not only that the drain can come out, the drain also can go in. Um, very important again, uh, if you have, uh, that you need to go back, you can go laparoscopically, uh, you can drain the urinoma, you can put laparoscopy drain, you can evaluate the disruption of the anastomosis, uh, you can place additional stitches in case you need it, uh, you can combine and place ureter catheters and usually you should close the the preparatory space you can and put an extra preparatory drain. Um, in case you cannot do it, you can go open approach. But usually laparoscopically, you can fix it. Prevention uh, always if you see that EOs are very close to the anastomosis of previous patient with terps, uh, you can do poster rackets. When you do poster rackets, you pull back the ureters, the UOs, and also the racket will help to decrease the tension and will help to reapproximate the bladder neck. To the urethra. I mean, here, any comment uh, when you feel that you're going to have traction, how you fix it, how to prevent that you're going to have leak from the anastomosis? So, I do my bladder neck reconstruction slightly differently. I do a fish mouth, so I take sutures at three and nine o'clock position. Uh, I just feel that uh, most leaks occur posteriorly. So, when you do a posterior racket angle, the angle between that, uh, that extension of the racket handle and the actual circular anastomosis is where a lot of leaks occur. So I like my posterior plate to be nice and flat. And I think if the posterior plate is flat and you have good sutures in the bladder and the urethra posteriorly, that's what gives the strength to the anastomosis. And so uh, I do a, a, a fish mouth and I really will test an anastomosis aggressively. I, I put in like 300 cc's in the bladder at the end just to make sure you really have a very, very distended bladder. The mistake is just putting in 60 in, 60 out, or 100 in, 100 out. These bladders are still very flabby and they may not manifest at that time. I, I must say though, since, I mean, I'm sure that this is the experience from the panel that really with robotic prostatectomy currently, having a major clinical leak is almost a rarity. I mean, I cannot remember the last time we had, and again, the occasional case is where you get a distraction and, and my thought is if there is any reason to go back in because you have to control bleeding or evacuate urine that is collected in there, take the time to see and see if you can fix it. Because robotically, you have that opportunity of going in and you'll still get exposure and be able to uh, fix the leak. This is how we place the, uh, the stents if we need it. We get a console tip uh, catheter and then we got the wire through the catheter and I think that's a nice trick. Uh, and, 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 one, and one other comment I'd like to also make is during this bladder neck, anything, any doubt, put a stent in. At least put it on one side. The last thing you want is an, an edema and a bilateral obstruction and having to perk somebody the day he's had a prostatectomy to lie prone and all that is not, is not fun. So, so I, I've never regretted putting a stent in, but I have regretted not putting a stent in. So even if the thought of a stent passes your mind, I just put a double J stent in. Uh, uh, in fact, today, I did a prostatectomy on somebody who had a TURP uh, two months ago, found Gleason 8 incidentally on the TURP, and his bladder neck was, the UO was right at the bladder neck. And so uh, I electively just put a stent in on at least one side, the other side was a little away, did the racket handle, and, and it's, I can sleep easier knowing that uh, I won't end up in a, in a bilateral obstruction scenario. Okay, so now let's see some... Or are you doing a fish mouth? Sorry? Is it a racket handle or a fish mouth on that? Fish mouth, fish mouth. Okay. So what I do is I, 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 I extend the fish mouth till I'm a, a couple of millimeters medial to my UO. So yeah. this way I know that my UO is lateral to where the fish mouth ends. And so in my anastomosis, I'm, I'm a little more comfortable. I, I'm with Mahir on that. I, I do it the same way. Yeah, the only thing that I feel that with the racket yeah. is that when you have tension, sometimes the... the uh, the posterior racket helped to reduce the tension, not the lateral rackets. Yeah, I'll just be a, a, a different. I would not, I worry about when I do a fish mouth about getting the ureter, uh, or in, the intramural ureter, because you know you've thinned out your bladder when, in doing so. I, so I actually do anterior racket. I agree with me here to get that posterior anastomosis completed. 
and get it get that tension free and i actually will do the anterior uh tennis racket so we have three different approaches here okay but if you have tension in the anastomosis what you would do go back and free the bladder up more okay yeah. but sometimes you free it laterally and you free it and, and it doesn't go is it possible wall? i will say renee i've never had a situation yeah. where but okay. between mobilizing it and extend and, and and doing an anterior racket i think you can get that posterior bladder down I'm, okay. i maybe i've not just seen it okay i agree me. i i to do all my tennis rackets uh racket repairs anteriorly except when the ureteric orifices are at the very edge for that patient i will do a posterior uh, reconstruction just to get some distance between the ureteric orifices and the bladder neck and then put it together but uh, renee i mean um, um, uh, if, the, if the concept you're espousing that if there is tension, doing a little bit of a posterior racket is going to take that tension away, that is, uh, I, I don't know, practically speaking, uh, if it's a couple centimeters, um, that won't do it, and, and, and at least in my opinion. Okay, let's see now some rectal injuries and some examples. Uh, I want to make two points here. Very important when we open uh, the posterior bladder neck, uh, sometimes we need to recognize there's the, uh, there's the Douglas pouch, peritoneum, and some people misunderstood the, uh, the peritoneum and they think they opened the rectum. I have seen some videos where they say this is the rectum, it's not the rectum, it's the Douglas pouch. And then the other thing important that when you pull in the prostate up, you're tenting the rectum up, and then there's a risk that you can open the rectum when you're tenting up the prostate. I'm just gonna show some examples that you can injure the rectum with your left hand, not necessarily with your right hand. You can do it with left hand, you can do it with right hand, you can do it in the apex, and you can do it the surgeon and the assistant with the suction. I'm gonna show you only some examples. Uh, here is the left hand of the surgeon, and you saw already, he make a hole. You don't need to get a foley in the rectum to recognize that hole in the rectum. And another example, doing the apex dissection. Initially, they saw that that was the assistant with the suction, but when I saw the video, I told them, no, it's not the assistant, it's the surgeon with the scissors. And you're gonna see it now. He's bringing the rectum up, and that's exactly the rectum. And he's opening the rectum. Wow. There's the rectum. That's a big margin of tissue they're taking with the specimen. <laughs> yeah, you see rectal injury on a grand scale. Yeah, and they should, I mean, the, the tissue plane, they're, work, they're not working from known to unknown. They're working again through the unknown. Okay, Indy, what do you do? Well, I'm gonna stop. The best way of getting out of a hole is to stop digging. And so, uh, I mean, this is just amazing. Um, absolutely. I mean, at the apex of the prostate, you have to be skinning the apex and it's millimeter by millimeter. And, uh, uh, you know, you don't want to go any distal to the apex, then you absolutely need to, to free up that apex. And, uh, but this was really on a very grand scale. Okay. What, uh, what do you do? Oh, sorry. Uh, well, um, I'd get colorectal involved for sure. And uh, that depends upon whether there is gross uh, contamination or not. Um, and if there is no gross contamination, like in this case, there just doesn't seem to be, I still have the colorectal surgeon standing by, firstly. Secondly, the way they are repairing this one is exactly the opposite of what ought to be done, which is they are repairing it in a, 
uh, at right angles to the uh, longitudinal axis of the rectum, there is going to be a rectal stenosis here. Uh, they have, firstly, they've cut out uh, a reasonable amount of the anterior rectal wall, and now they're closing it in, uh, in the exact opposite of what it ought to be done. It should be done at, the, at right angles to this. Um, and to do that, you, you can't really do it until you free up the rectum. So this requires really um, mobilization of the rectum on either side bilaterally to free it up more and, and also more proximally such that the cephalad end of this particular uh, rectotomy is mobile enough to bring it to the caudal end of the rectotomy. And this has to be sutured in a transverse manner, not a longitudinal manner, firstly. Secondly, enough mobilization has to be done such that a second layer of imbricating sutures is placed on top of that. Uh, first layer, so it's a double layer thing. And then finally, bring omentum down and uh, uh, do this all with a colorectal surgeon either present there, et cetera. But doing this in a, uh, on the spur of the moment, uh, cavalier manner to put it back together, it's just gonna be more problems down the road. If, if you have any, any doubt or any injury, you can do the bubble test. Uh, uh, sometimes people say that you will see the injuries. That's not true. Sometimes they're going to be very small. Um, if you have any doubt, there's nothing wrong to do the bubble test. And basically, you're going to see here that you cannot recognize the injury. And when you do the bubble test, And, and with the bubble test, you found that you repair the rectum and you can repeat the bubble test after you repeat, after you repair the rectum to check what's going on. Uh, Indy already mentioned everything, how to manage the rectal injury. Very important, you can open the Douglas pouch and you can advance momentum if you have any doubt. Uh, if the injury is too long, as he mentioned, you should do transverse, not longitudinal. Uh, these colorectal guys will put a Hagar dilator in the rectum to check that you're not closing you're not narrowing the, the lumen of the rectum. Very important that before you remove the catheter, you need to do a cystogram. Uh, because if there's, the rectum is perfectly closed, but you have any leak of the anastomosis, that leak will erosionate and will make a fistula. So uh, Ramit, let me just make a quick comment that the, the rectal injury that you showed, uh, just for the audience to keep this in mind, for us to repair that particular rectal injury is going to take easily an hour, hour and a half of work, not uh, you know, 10 minute closure here. That is a, all proceeding comes to a halt and this has to be done because um, the sequela of uh, um, in, inexact repair uh, are, are horrific. If, if a patient is complaining that he's having some stools or something cloudy in the urine, you have to be careful. If they complain that they're having some blood coming from the anus, you have to be careful. That not necessarily are hemorrhoids. In this case, if you have a rectal injury, you have to suspect if the patient is complaining that he has blood, because that could be a rectal injury also. Um, I'm going to skip this because we don't have time to show that, that fistula. I'm just going to show one last case of post-operative bleeding. Uh, this was a case that I, I, I was doing with a, with a fellow, and we was doing a, a right uh, nephro-U, and uh, as you see here, uh, we put a, we get uh, the artery, we put a, a, tor um, a vessel loop in the vein to check that the stapler went all the way through the vein, and we got the vein, now we found the real main artery, and now we clip the artery, and you see, I always ask uh, two way clips proximal. And you see all, I, I never save in, in wet clips. And now we're proceeding to go to the uh, adrenal area. And the hilum is perfect. I, I feel that. And now we get the adrenal with the stapler. 
And uh, you're gonna see that there was a small bleeding here that I really, he was doing the case I was assisting. I really didn't saw it from, from the bedside here. There's a small arterial bleeding here. I don't know if you can see my pointer here. That there's a small bleeding here that we didn't saw it. We was completely focused in progressing there. You see the bleeding here? There's a small bleeding here that we didn't see. Well, the patient uh, went to, to the, normally everything was okay. And then they start dropping the hemoglobin and patients start getting stable. We did the CT scan, and I really saw the hilum was perfectly. We put a lot of wet clips. We looked; everything was fine. What's going on? And you see that active bleeding there. And then uh, we took him back. And what you would do here, uh, me here, well, Mike? Patient is not unstable, but here we put like three, four units of blood. And uh, you, in the CT scan, you see that the patient has an active bleeding. I would probably start off robotically again. I would go through my same incisions. Um, if I was struggling to evacuate the hematoma or get the hematoma out of my way, I would probably stick a hand port in and evacuate it and then look for it. I don't think I would open right away. Um, again, a couple of things I'd ask myself is how long this has been going on for. This has been going on for 45 minutes, an hour, and this is what it looks like. That's probably arterial, and then I may be opening, I'm a little more worried. If this has been a 24-hour process where he was a little hypotensive, he gave him a couple of boluses, he didn't get better, then he gave him some more fluid, and then he got him a CAT scan, he came back and he saw this, um, I would be a lot more comfortable at least starting off robotically. So when I have things that happen within an hour to two hour period, I gotta go back, I tend to be a little bit more aggressive with opening, when I, this thing progresses over a 12 to 24 hour period, then I tend to go back robotically. That's sort of my, my thought process. Yeah, this case was like 20 hours after we put two, three units, three units and patient was stable. And then we took him back laparoscopically. Very important that you see now that the patient is completely lateral. And I'm using these upper ports to, to get the camera because if you try to get it from here, the, all the blood will not let you see. And you see that I'm getting a suction of 10 millimeter suction. Yeah. Get ready to, and here's the video, to get all the clots out. Yeah. Renee, I, I, I'm gonna respectfully disagree with uh, a little bit here. Okay. Um, if you told me this is now 20 hours later, we know that I, I would have considered with active extravasation that you saw in the CT scan to consider an angiogram and embolization. We know that this is lateral to the vena cava. So we're gonna have a stump that the IR guys could have embolized. And my first line therapy for this situation would be, uh, Mike is right, if it's the first hour, I would consider being aggressive and opening, but this is the next day I strongly would have considered an angiogram first. Yeah, well, I have that, that option. Uh, I found that it was gonna be more difficult to try to set that. That's why I took him laparoscopically. I know that the hyalin was not gonna be bleeding. And uh, that's why I tried to the, do it first. The uh, only, the only uh, comment I make against embolizing and doing what Rene, you did is that I think there, is, there are two goals of this procedure. One is to stop the bleeding, of course, but the second is to also evacuate that hematoma because if the patient is distended and you know, bloated and, and has a lot of clot in there, by evacuating that clot, you're going to make that post-operative course much more smoother rather than somebody who's got a ton of clot in there. They'll have ileus for an extended period. And, and that, even with partial, that's my only kind of thing. But on the other hand, if it's a contained hematoma, the abdomen is not distended, then I agree with extravasation. That's the opportunity where you know that you'll see that source and you can embolize it. But, but I think that uh, you know what you did here achieves one extra goal, which is evacuating the clot and and and, and improving slightly the post-operative recovery. And that 10 millimeter suction is I know you mentioned already, but really another good take-home message is you know when you have a fair amount of bleeding, even when you're doing the case initially, you come back. Always have know that where that is. Know that's available. Because there's a huge difference of using a 10 millimeter versus a five millimeter. Yeah, you need to get ready and get set everything because you're gonna go back, you need to have suction. I think we have already one hour. 
Professor, you want to say final words? Oh, um, um, Rene, my compliments. You built this library uh, of um, um, robotic uh, and laparoscopic complications over a 20 year period. I remember you started this in Cleveland and uh, you have really educated a whole army of surgeons um, with these videos that you've collected painstakingly and uh, uh, reporting honestly and everything. So thank you for this amazing uh, teaching that you've been doing at the AUA postgraduate courses and everywhere else as well. Uh, but, uh, you know, uh, I hope everybody's safe and healthy and your families are good. And uh, this Corona thing has um, made social distancing actually bring us closer together. So there was no way we would be doing this if the Corona thing had not happened. We'd be sitting here in an evening talking, but my God, we have, we had over 200 people. And uh, so again, thank you, Renee, but more importantly, thank you, uh, Dr. Jeff Kadedu. Thank you, Dr. Michael Steifelman. Uh, it's pleasure to be able to call you friends and learn from each other. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Stay safe. Bye. 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 Bye.